In the circuit shown, we're going to determine all branch currents using nodal analysis. The goal is simple. Find the voltage at each node relative to a reference point, usually ground, using Kirchhoff's current law. Once we know the node voltages, calculating the branch currents is a breeze. We'll follow the standard eight-step process for nodal analysis. If you need a refresher, we've explained each step in detail in our earlier tutorial. Check out the link in the description. This circuit includes two current sources and no voltage sources, but don't worry, that actually makes things simpler in some ways. We'll break it down step by step and keep the analysis smooth and straightforward. Let's get started. First things first, we need to label all components and their values. If they're not already labeled, that's step one. But in this case, everything's clearly marked, so step one is done for us. Let's move on. Step two is to identify all the relevant nodes in the circuit and pick one to be the reference or ground node. A node is simply a point where two or more elements are connected. And if there's nothing between two connected points, no resistor, no source, they're treated as the same node. Now take a good look at this circuit. How many nodes can you spot? That's right, three. Next, we need to choose one node as the reference. Ideally, it's the one that connects to the most elements or sources, since that can simplify the equations. In this circuit, each node connects to two resistors and a current source. So we have the flexibility to choose any of them as the reference. I'll go with the node at the bottom. Don't worry, regardless of which one we pick, the final branch currents will be the same. The only difference will be how the equations are written. So let's go ahead with the selected reference node and move to the next step. The next step is to assign voltages to the nodes. If there were any voltage sources directly connected to the reference node, we'd label those voltages first, but in this circuit, we don't have any voltage sources. So instead, we label the remaining node voltages ourselves. Let's call this one V1 and the other V2. With all the node voltages labeled, we're ready to keep going. Next, we assign current directions and voltage polarities in the circuit. Start with the power sources. For current sources, the direction is already shown by an arrow, so we'll stick with that. In this branch, we have a 5 amp current, and in the other, it's 10 amps. Now for the resistors, we'll label the currents through them as I1, I2, and I3. The directions we pick here are completely up to us. If we guess wrong, no big deal. The math will just give us a negative result showing the true direction. Just remember, label the voltage polarities to match your assumed current directions. That'll keep things consistent and make our calculations easier. Let's move on. In step five, we use Ohm's law to express the current through each resistor. Ohm's law tells us that current equals the voltage difference across a resistor divided by its resistance. So for the four ohm resistor, current I1 is V1 minus V2 divided by four. For the two ohm resistor, current I2 is V1 divided by two. And for the six ohm resistor, current I3 is V2 divided by six. Now we've got I1, I2, and I3 all written in terms of V1 and V2. With these equations ready, we can move on to applying Kirchhoff's current law to solve for the unknown node voltages. At the first node, we apply Kirchhoff's current law. Five amps flow in, while I1 and I2 flow out. So our equation is five equals I1 plus I2. At the second node, both 10 amps and I1 flow in, while five amps and I3 flow out. That gives us 10 plus I1 equals five plus I3. Now we substitute the expressions for I1, I2, and I3 using Ohm's law. Plugging these into the equations gives us two equations with two unknowns, V1 and V2. Now we can solve the two equations using basic algebra, like substitution or elimination. But when there are more than two variables, matrix methods often make things cleaner. Let's rewrite the equations in matrix form. Just make sure the order of the variables, V1 and V2, is the same in both equations. That's important for accuracy. Once it's in matrix form, we'll use Kramer's rule. To do that, we first find the determinant of the coefficient matrix. For a two by two matrix, it's easy. Multiply the diagonal elements and subtract. 
In our case, the determinant is 12. Next, we calculate the determinant for V1. We replace the first column of the matrix with the constants from the right-hand side of the equations, 20 and 60. Multiply the diagonals, subtract, and we get a determinant of 160. Then we do the same for V2. This time, we replace the second column with 20 and 60. After calculating, the determinant of V2 is 240. Now we can directly calculate the V1 and V2. V1 is 160 divided by 12, which gives us approximately 13.3 volts. V2 is 240 divided by 12, or 20 volts. And that's it. If you follow the steps carefully, Kramer's rule is a great way to solve simultaneous equations, especially in circuit analysis. Finally, now that we have the node voltages, we can use Ohm's law to calculate the branch currents. We just plug the values of V1 and V2 into the current formulas we set up earlier. For I1, after substituting the voltages, we get negative 1.67 amps. That negative sign, it simply means the actual current flows in the opposite direction from what we assumed. Next, I2 comes out to 6.65 amps, so our guess direction was correct. And for I3, we get 3.33 amps, also flowing as expected. And that's it. We've successfully solved the entire problem using nodal analysis.